hello to your fellow attendees. Um, I think though, I'm gonna get started and uh, we're gonna roll on into this webinar. Um, hi everyone, I'm Adrian Isaac. I'm the Marketing and Communications Director at the National Ski Areas Association. Um, thanks for taking time out of your spring season to come and join us today. Um, we are helping to present this webinar with folks from CLEAR, the Clean Energy Economy for the Region. And they are working with the Colorado Clean Diesel Program to help get all of you ski areas some funding to green your heavy vehicle fleet. So the purpose of this webinar today is to talk about how you can obtain this grant funding and also reduce or eliminate your carbon emissions from uh, your heavy machinery like snowcats and groomers. Um, tactically, this is probably most beneficial for the ski areas that are in Colorado, but for um, folks in other states, you know, I think you'll you'll maybe get inspired to seek out these grants in your own state or region. Um, there are many programs like this across the country that can help, you know, kind of alleviate that cost pressure of of getting your your fleet greened. Um, we are recording the session today. We'll send the link out to folks who've attended so you can share it with other people at your resort. Um, and then also we're gonna do questions and answers at the end of this presentation. So put your, uh, any questions that you have over the course of it in the Q&A box down there, we'll be monitoring that. And then we'll leave a little bit of time at the end to address those. Um, what's really cool about this, we're not just gonna talk about the funding, but we're also gonna talk to some folks at Mountains who are using this technology and talk to the vendors who are actually um, putting this uh, hybrid and electric motor technology out. So not only will you learn what's out there, but you'll also learn what's ahead for this as these technologies develop. And honestly, it's, it's really cool to see the industry kind of come together and um, recognize that, you know, reducing our carbon emissions is, is critical and we can't, you know, we can't continue business as usual. So hopefully you will learn a little bit of something today and be able to obtain um, some partial grant funding to help with these vehicle replacements. Um, before we dive in, I just wanna let you know who you'll be talking with today. We've got Stefan Johnson. He's the Transportation Program Manager at CLEAR. We've got Adam Teets, the Regional Sales Rep uh, for the Rocky Mountains, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona for Piston Bully. We have Connor Lyons joining us from Crystal Mountain Resort, Washington. He is the snow surfaces supervisor there, and he's gonna tell you about his kind of firsthand experience using, using this equipment. And then we have Anthony Ellison, who's the product specialist for Tyga Motors, um, working with green snowmobile fleets. So really knowledgeable folks about this technology. And then, um, we will kick off with Stefan, who's going to talk a little bit more about the Colorado Clean Diesel Program and how your resorts can obtain funding for this effort. Awesome. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, before we get to the really exciting part of this webinar, we do have some housekeeping and admin to get through. Uh, but this is very important administration since it deals with the grant funding details for Colorado-based organizations. So next slide, if you will, please, Zuleika. So the purpose of the Colorado Clean Diesel Program is to uh, provide grants and rebates that protect human health and improve air quality by reducing harmful emissions from diesel engines. And so this does involve uh, precursor, the funding involves taking an existing uh, diesel vehicle or piece of equipment out of one's fleet and replacing it with a newer, cleaner technology solution. So there is a scrappage requirement. Uh, CLEAR has contracted with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to run the Colorado Clean Diesel Program statewide. And the, the uh, program funding comes from two sources, uh, Colorado State Allocated DARA funding via the United States Environmental Protection Agency as well as the state of Colorado's Volkswagen Diesel Emissions Settlement Trust. Um, and it's important to note that uh, the VW Trust funding uh, can only fund zero emissions technologies and solutions. So we're really excited uh, to hear about some of the developments 
in the ski industry uh, regarding zero emissions technology solutions, as well as hybrid electric options. Next slide, please. So I know that we do have some other organizations that are not based in Colorado that are joining us. Uh, They're not eligible for uh, Colorado Clean Diesel Program funding, obviously, but I would encourage them to look at the United States National DARA Program uh, or check in with your uh, state's government agency that administers the state allocated DARA funding. And I've provided the uh, website links where you might go uh, seek out that information and contacts and would really encourage you to do so. Next slide, please. So getting right into how the, the grant funding works, um, for hybrid electric snowcats, the grant amount that an organization can receive is capped at 25% of the total project cost. Um, so, you know, for an example project, if someone is purchasing a new hybrid electric snowcat and the total project cost is $500,000, uh, the organization applying would be uh, eligible for a maximum grant of $125,000 and their cost share would be $375,000. Also important to note that electrical infrastructure, including charging stations uh, needed to support the operations of this sort of equipment and uh, vehicles can be included in a total project cost. Next slide, please. So the grant amount for a zero emissions snowcat, whether that's hydrogen or all electric or renewable natural gas, potentially of future developments, that is, uh, those are eligible for a 45% uh, grant. So almost half. Again, with the example of a $500,000 uh, total project cost, this means the applicant would be eligible for 205, $225,000 and uh, their cost share would be $275,000. Next slide, please. So applicant eligibility requirements. The applicant must be a business or entity that owns and operates diesel vehicles or diesel equipment in Colorado. They must own the vehicle or equipment being replaced. They must ensure the vehicle or equipment being replaced is registered in the state of Colorado and ensure the new vehicle or equipment will also be registered in the state. Next slide, please. So for the existing diesel snowcat that one would be uh, scrapping, there are some uh, additional requirements for that uh, existing equipment in the fleet. It must be fully operational. Uh, it must have operated at least 500 hours annually for the two years prior. It must have at least three years of remaining life at the time of the upgrade, and it must be a tier three engine or lower unless you are applying for replacing that uh, existing uh, snowcat with a zero emission vehicle or piece of equipment, in which case uh, you can replace an existing tier four vehicle engine in your fleet. Next slide, please. So the scrappage requirements are quite robust. Uh, the program really wants to ensure that you are actually taking an older uh, diesel vehicle or piece of equipment out of one's operations. And so the scrappage requirements are quite robust. They involve cutting a three inch hole in the engine block, cutting chassis rails in half and uh, obtaining all sort of appropriate documentation for uh, proving that you really did take that vehicle permanently out of operations. So uh, we do accept applications on a rolling basis. So organizations are eligible to submit an application at any time throughout the year. But uh, I just gave an example sort of timeline of the way uh, one's application could work and be processed. Um, we know that uh, Oftentimes ski resorts do some of their procurement and purchasing in May and June. And so we want to work with ski resorts and operations and their uh, procurement teams to, to make sure that our timing uh, aligns well with their procurement decisions. And so if you are interested in applying for the funding, I would really encourage you 
to get in touch with, with me and the organization, and we can um, do whatever we can to, to best support your application and make sure that it aligns well with your purchasing timelines. It's also really important to note that the way the grant funding works is as a reimbursement grant. We're not authorized to give the money upfront. Um, it's not until you've received your new piece of equipment and have provided all documentation, including invoicing, um, evidence of your scrappage vehicle actually being scrapped, that uh, we are able to release the funding to you. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, evaluation criteria for applications, the, the most important one is the estimated emissions reductions per dollar. And then uh, there's other criteria that include innovation. Uh, the example being, you know, the first time technology is deployed in Colorado. And so in the case of hybrid electric or all electric or hydrogen snowcats, uh, you would score full, full points there. There are uh, no uh, such uh, case studies yet in the state of Colorado. So we're really excited to hope to see some very soon and hope that this funding might uh, enable that to happen. Um, the applicant cost share would be a factor in competitiveness for the application. Uh, you can apply for less and then obviously the uh, funding would go further in terms of the actual emissions reductions we would be able to achieve. And then uh, the location or service area of the equipment and where it is being deployed with priority given to non-attainment zone locations. Next slide, please. And so if you are interested in uh, submitting an application, I would really encourage you to both get in touch with uh, me and the CLEAR team and visit our website, which is um, cocleandiesel.org and then to submit an application, it's just backslash apply. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation. I know there was a lot of information that we went into and so um, I'll be eager to answer any questions at the end of the presentation as well as connect with folks offline uh, following the webinar to talk in more detail. So thanks so much and looking forward to our uh, next presentations. Hey, Stefan, thank you so much for walking us through that. And you, you know, guys, look, for, for those of you who've been doing sustainability for a long time, you know there's not one answer to the climate problem and that they're not always easy solutions. But if you put in a little bit of effort here and, and rely on the folks from CLEAR to help walk you through the process, this could be a huge benefit to your ski area and, and move your fleet replacement along at you know, a little bit of a faster speed than it might without funding available. So um, definitely reach out to Stefan right there if you have any other questions and uh, we can walk you through the process. And um, now we're gonna throw it over to Adam at Piston Bully. He's gonna tell us about the tech that's out there and what you can expect in the future, Adam. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, wanted to first talk about the Piston Bully, the 600 E plus. Um, the picture here is the current vehicle in production. This is the second generation of the 600 E plus. Between testing and uh, introduction to market, the Snowcat's been in the um, market for almost 10 years. So there's been a lot of, a lot of on snow time with it. It's a good proven technology. Um, both the generations are ran in North America and Europe. So um, it's out there and this is the one available for market. Again, this is the hybrid, uh, the diesel electric. Basically it runs like a uh, locomotive. The, the motor acts as a generator to power the, the electric drives. I'll explain a little bit more about that and the difference between it and a regular snow groomer in the next few slides. Next one. So this is kind of a picture of some of the ideas behind the 600D plus um, and some of the highlights. Uh, start by the operating platform. The new generation of all the piston boy cats uh, share a similar operating platform across the line. So there's a lot of familiarity for operators. When they get in, they're not gonna notice a whole lot difference in a, a hybrid snow cat than their regular one. Um, the diesel electric drive, it complies with 
stage five Europe and uh, tier four final for EPA for North America. Um, significantly reduces the emissions. Um, the engine can run at a much lower RPM. Uh, familiarity with it, it actually runs under 1200. So you're not burning a lot of fuel and you're not putting out a lot of emissions. Um, the chassis of the vehicle, it has the longest frame and the highest torque, which uh, equates to the best climbing and the best thrust. The electric motors on the back, they're what, what uh, attribute to this torque. Um, it's instant, there's no ramp up, there's no drive like no hydraulic system. And the energy transfer for an electric motor is much more efficient than a hydraulic transfer. So that uh, adds to the efficiency of the machine. In addition, as it uses the electric power uphill, it actually recuperates it from the track spinning downhill. So it recuperates some of that um, natural energy from gravity of going downhill. And then the hydraulic tiller drive, it just uh, allows for greater flexibility in the back end. Instead of being stuck with only one tiller, you could put any tiller in our line on it, or you can add other options like a drag from another manufacturer. So um, go ahead to the next slide. So this is uh, this technology, this is, this is the result of it. You get 20% less fuel usage, 20% less noise, 20% less emissions, and you get addition of torque and thrust. <clears throat> That's one of the great things about the machine is there was no give in performance in order to get um, economy and an environmental benefit. So the result of all this technology is, is what you see there. Uh, next slide shows the the, the system, um, one of the great things about the system is it's completely independent, so it doesn't have any effect on the elect other electronics on board of uh, the Snowcat. Um, also, it's completely independent of all of the other functions, so when your mechanics open it up, they're going to be able to work on this just like any other um, piston bully. Uh, the only difference is going to be in the drives, which is uh, long lasting uh, and, and easy to service. Uh, so basically, you should be changing out parts rather than servicing them, and the rest of the vehicle is, is still the same. You can see here that it's basically two generators, two drive motors. They get ran off of the, the motor, and then um, the uh, stage five for the emissions. There is no onboard storage, so there's no need for any additional infrastructure at your resort. There's no plugging this in overnight to charge the system, it should be the same as plugging it in for the block heater. So there's no, no additional infrastructure needed. Um, and then the next slide. And that's the uh, general overview of the 600D plus. I'm sure there's plenty of questions. Um, I can take those in the Q&A or get a hold of me at any time to get any more information. Hey, thank you, Adam, for running us through the 600 and um, learning a little bit more about that. We're going to come back to you in a sec, but I want to throw it over to Connor at Crystal Mountain and talk a little bit about his experience um, using these machines. And, and um, he can tell you a little bit more about how it has helped their slope maintenance and emissions. Yeah, so um, we have two of the first generation tier three E plus machines. Um, we have a fleet of about 15 snow cats total. And uh, among the, most of those are 600s. Um, and just kind of echoing what Adam has said, like you, you really notice the difference. It's a better machine to run. It's not just more efficient. It has that torque and you really do feel it. Um, Whenever I get into a free cat at Crystal Mountain, I'm always going for the e-machine because it's quieter, it's smoother. Um, another feature that it has that the standard hydrostatic drive cats don't have that I really like is um, whenever you stop the machine, it actually applies the brake automatically, which is really nice for doing close work, uh, getting into terminals and stuff like that you're not going to have that tendency to roll into things that you do with hydrostatic machines. Um, but yeah, they're, they're quieter. You really feel the torque when you're climbing, uh, great for big push projects, great for just everyday grooming and you get the fuel savings. So it's, it's just a better machine in every way. And, uh, 
I've only run the new tier four machine, uh, the demo that we had for a few hours, but that just seems like another even better improvement over what we have. We've got probably five or 6,000 hours on both of our e-machines and, uh, the guys love them. The guys love running them. Like, you know, we're, they're kind of always fighting for who gets to run the e-machines, but, uh, yeah, they're great. We've, we've had a really great experience with them. Thanks so much for that kind of overview, Connor. I know we said, uh, we were going to save some Q and a for, the end of the presentation, we'll still do that, but we just got a great question from uh, Beth Yetter in the Q&A that maybe Connor yeah. could speak to a little bit. And um, Beth's, Beth's asking, um, she's heard that one of the issues with the 600E Plus is the weight of the machine compared to more conventional cats. Um, I have yeah. been told by a few of our groomers that in certain snow conditions, it can affect the grooming product due to the weight of the 600E Plus. Uh, Connor, can you speak a little bit to that kind of the, the weight of the 600E plus versus a uh, conventional diesel cat? Yeah, they, they are a bit heavier. Um, also, the ones that we have, the tier three machines are heavier, I, I believe, than the newer tier four machines because uh, ours have a big electric motor on the tiller as well, whereas the newer versions have uh, just hydrostatic tillers. Um, but yeah, you, you do feel a, a difference in weight. Uh, it kind of changes more just the way you groom with the machine. You, you kind of have to feel it out a little bit differently. Um, but the added torque makes up for that in a lot of circumstances. And it, it's, it's kind of something that takes some getting used to um, and just making sure operators are being a little more cautious with turning around in them because they are heavier and stuff like that. But they... They also have um, the newer style tracks that have seven belts instead of five, which kind of makes it a, a beefier, stronger machine as well. But yeah, it, they are heavier. You do notice that a little bit. Excellent. Adam, do you want to add anything in there? Yeah, I think Connor kind of hit most of the points there. The, the new one, the latest uh, second generation is actually lighter than the previous generation. So um, some of those, you know, items were addressed. Uh, I think the big thing he hit on is that's where our track technology has changed and come into play is um, the ground pressure is is really insignificant, almost nothing compared to, the, to a standard frontline groomer. Awesome. So I see we're getting some other really great questions for Connor and Adam. Um, we're going we're gonna to save those to the end because we still have some really exciting content to get through, um, but, but we will return to them later in the presentation. But um, now we're gonna kick it back to Adam and hear a little bit what uh, the future looks like um, and, and what we can be excited to see in the, the coming years. So back to you, Adam. Thanks, Devin. Um, so the next thing to talk about is the piston bully, the 100E+. Um, you can see on this slide, it's zero emissions and 100% piston bully. I think going back to a little bit of what Connor said is, you know, the idea of these machines is is to be green and, and careful in the environment. But one of the careful considerations is to make sure that you don't release a product that's inferior. So, you know, we're not gonna sacrifice the Piston Bully pro product or name just for the no novelty of the technology. And uh, I think that these machines really show that, that we've done a good job in making sure that they're still very high performing. Um, in the next slide, it's the, uh, there's the picture of the actual machine. Um, it is, uh, was introduced in 2019 at the Interalpine Show over in Europe. Um, it's been on the snow before that and since then, so it's had over a year of testing uh, both indoor and on cross-country slopes. Um, we want to make sure, you know, that again, it's piston bully quality, but that the vehicle can also be supported um, and that it can be affordable to bring to the market. So that's uh, where it's at right now. The next slide shows a little bit of, of what the insides look like. This is um, electric motors driven by electric fuel cells that are charged overnight. Currently, the, the first production of the Piston Bully, or the first Piston Bully 100E, um, the energy capacity of it was 126 kilowatt hours with a rated voltage of 400 volts. 
um, we gave it plenty of power and plenty of torque. Um, the charging time and the run time is what everybody's, you know, peak interests are. And that's gone up with the, with, with testing and with new components. And, you know, that'll be a huge consideration in bringing it to market. Currently the charging time is about five hours. You get a state of charge of 75% and six and a half hours, you get a battery that's completely charged. Uh, mathematically with these electric motors that provides two and a half to three hours of run time. And we're, we're seeing that out in the field. So um, it's a little light for some applications, but for other applications, it's, it's a certain, certainly, you know, enough time. And as technology grows, so will that, that capacity. Um, and then the next slide just shows the current lineup. Um, you know, we have physical machines that are in the market and ready to go to market. Uh, the middle one is the, the first generation 600 E plus, the one on the left is the new generation. And then on the right, you see the 100 E plus. Um, and then next is uh, what's next for us. So kind of exciting, haven't really released it all to everybody, but um, wanted to know that the, the plan is, is that there will be a couple 100 E's in North America next year, um, both for demo and, and to demonstrate to the customers. And we're planning a first production of, of those vehicles as well. So we'll be taking orders for the following season. Um, that's kind of the next big news for the 100E is it'll be good to see to, to bring it to market and be on its testing phase. Um, the other exciting news is uh, back in 2019, Casbor, we partnered with a Austrian um, project it's called High Snow Groomer, and it would be a hydrogen driven uh, snow groomer with, co with the corresponding infrastructure. Over in Europe, they're trying to grow this as a community. So their buses, trucks, other pieces of what they use would also be uh, developed within this, this project. Um, but, and a big part of this project is to, uh, to try to find kind of a modular and mobile fuel cell for remote fueling to make fueling easier for the hydrogen vehicles, because that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, and Casbor is committed that when the infrastructure is there, Piston Bully will be ready with a hydrogen vehicle for the market. So that's interesting technology as well. Um, and then again, it's an exciting new product. Didn't want to bore you with an hour presentation, but any questions you have now or are down the road, I'm happy to answer. Awesome, Adam. Thank you so much for, for giving us a sneak peek into the future. You know, I, I got to say, it's really cool to see our industry suppliers kind of responding to this um, need for ski areas to reduce carbon emissions in this way and to find these solutions uh, for what can be um, a very technical and sometimes difficult endeavor uh, working at high altitudes in cold environments. So very cool to hear about all of these technologies that Piston Bully is actively working on. Um, I just want to note before I throw it to my friend from the north at Taiga Motors um, that if you are a sustainable slope signatory with NSAA and you are working on your badges, um, greening your fleet in this way would count towards your transportation badge. So uh, you could use this project to um, apply for that badge and, and hopefully move toward it. Next, I want to throw it over to Anthony Ellison at Taiga Motor Works. He's going to talk a little bit about their electric snowmobile fleet. And while there are some different considerations in terms of grant funding for snowmobiles, um, I think it's pretty cool to see the technologies they're working with and how um, powerful they can be. Anthony. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Adrian. <clears throat> so like she just said, my name is Anthony Ellison. I'm a product specialist at Taiga. Uh, part of my job is to bring these products around and show them to people and talk about them. Uh, and my goal for today is just to get you guys excited about electric snowmobile and what the future holds for us. Um, so I'll go over Tiger history a little bit, where we come from. I'll talk about our few product lines, then I'll focus on snowmobiles and especially the tech that's behind them. Then I'll touch on commercial operations, uh, environmental impacts, and then I know we have a Q&A session, so uh, feel free to ask me any questions afterwards. First, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you guys, I'm calling from Revelstoke out here in uh, Western Canada. We've been here for a month with a team of engineers and a team of content production. So I've been a part of the content production team and we've been in the back country in the mountains shooting some stuff with our mountain snowmobiles, fully electric. So I'm gonna start the, just the presentation by showing you a quick video. Just a heads up, uh, videos over teams are a little bit choppy. So it'll be a little bit awkward, but I think the visuals are still pretty good and, and it's worth showing you guys.
All right. We can go to the next slide, right? So just again, these are 100% electric snowmobiles. It was one of the first times we've had in the mountains. So it's pretty uh, impressive to see in person. Uh, so Tiger is a Canadian company. It was founded six years ago in Montreal. Uh, the founders actually participated in a university competition in which they had to create an electric snowmobile. And they got so many requests from ski resorts to sell them that snowmobile or to produce more that they realized there was a real opportunity here. Uh, so out of university, they founded Tiger Motors and they spent the last six years working on an electric snowmobile and powertrain from the ground up. So you can go to the next slide. So I just said we're working on electric snowmobiles, but actually our first product that will hit the market is the Orca. It's a fully electric personal watercraft. Just like our snowmobile, it is completely silent, which gives a pretty unique experience on the water. Uh, I won't talk about it too much, but I just wanted you guys to know that it's coming out this summer. So keep an eye out on lakes and rivers in North America. You might, uh, you might see a couple. Next slide, please. So let's talk about snowmobiles. We have three models. The red one that was in the video is the Echo. This is our mountain model. It's got a long track, narrow stance, perfect from what we've been doing out here in the Rockies. The blue one on the right is the Atlas. This is our high performance crossover model. It's got a wide stance and a short track, perfect for trail riding like we do out east in the Eastern Canada and Eastern US. It actually does zero to 100 kilometers an hour in under three seconds, so pretty high performance. Both the Echo and the Atlas have the equivalent of 120 horsepower, and they have a performance version that has 180 horsepower. Now, finally, on the left, you have the Nomad. This is our utility snowmobile. Uh, it's got a long track and a wide stance, which, which makes it very stable and gives it great traction. So this is perfect for com commercial operations. Uh, I'm going to talk more about Nomad in a few minutes. But for now, I'd like to talk a little bit about the technology platform behind our snowmobiles. That's really what sets them apart and makes them great. Next slide, please. Awesome. So we use a very similar powertrain technology in all our vehicles. Up to 95% of the parts are shared between the different lineups. Now, I mentioned that we had a watercraft and now the snowmobiles, and you can see on the slide here a little bit of a teaser on what we're working on behind the scenes. So out of all the aspects of our technology platform, there's a few that I want to focus on today. The first is the thermal management system. So this system does a few things, but its subjective globally is to make sure that the components are always at the right temperature to maximize power and efficiency. So let's say that the snowmobile sleeps overnight and it's super cold, minus 30 degrees. When you turn it on in the morning, that components are frozen solid. So the computer re will realize that and it will heat up the coolant. Now the coolant will be then used to warm up the battery and motor to an optimal working temperature. Now, once you start riding, the battery and motor will maintain their own temperature just because energy expenditure creates heat and you may actually need to cool them down. So the same liquid will now go through the tunnel of the snowmobile, get cooled down by the snow and be used to cool down the motor and battery. So the same system does both warm and cool. Now, the, the objective and the achievement of this system is that whether you're riding at plus 30 or minus 30 degrees, you won't lose any efficiency. You won't lose half of your battery life due to the cold like your phone would on a very cold day. Now, the other part of our technology I want to focus on is the advanced software. So electric vehicles, just like a snowmobile, are pretty much a big computer. This gives us, the manufacturer, complete control over how the snowmobile performs. So we can control things like maximum speed, torque ramps, amount of regen braking applied on downhills. On top of that, all the snowmobiles are connected to GPS, Wi-Fi, and cellular network. That means that we can run remote diagnostics and remote software updates. So if in a few months we develop a new feature, we can update all of our snowmobiles so that they all benefit from the latest and greatest in our operating system. Also, owners can change some of these settings from an app on their phone. So if you're sending your kid out on a ride and it's his first time and you want it to be super safe, you can tone down speed, torque, acceleration, all of that to make sure that it's totally safe for him. And another advantage, advantage since this is all software is we can listen to your guys' ideas. This is one of the first versions of our snowmobile. So we're, we're still open and, and gathering feed, feedback and knowledge to improve them. Uh, and our programmers can rapidly program new features depending on your guys' specific needs. All right, so now I've did a lot of talk mumbo jumbo. Let's go back to Nomad. I want to talk about it in a little bit more details. So like I said, this is our utility snowmobile. It comes in at two different battery pack configurations, 20 kilowatt hours or 25 kilowatt hours. 
On groomed surfaces, you can expect a range of 100 and 135 kilometers respectively for each battery pack. Of course, driving style and snow conditions will influence range a little bit. The Nomad comes in standard with the windshield, the two up seating, the cargo rack, and a 154 inch studded track. Now, something that's unique about all of our snowmobiles is that they are direct drive. So that means there's no transmission, no CVT. That means you can have very precise throttle control, no throttle lag at all. You can even crawl at one kilometer per hour, which is unheard of for typical snowmobiles unless you want to burn your belt off. Now combine this with the fact that we can have max torque at zero RPM on a studded track makes for an incredible towing machine. Now you can tow on the way up and then on the way down, you can turn on regenerative braking. So regen braking will regen battery when towing on the way down. It's very smooth and it inspires confidence. It doesn't lock the track and it provides really good deceleration because it applies negative torque directly in the motor. It also spares the brakes. Finally, when the summer comes around, you just need to park them and forget them. There's nothing special to take care of. No need to like summarize them for the summer and they'll be ready to go when the winter comes around. Final pricing, final pricing sorry, isn't set yet, but Nomad will start around 15,000 US dollars. Now, the fact that there's no CVT is a perfect segue for my next topic. I wanna to talk about commercial operations and the associated savings that comes from going electric. Perfect. So you can save up to 60% in maintenance cost and over 80% in fuel. You don't need to add any fluids to the snowmobile. Obviously there's no gas, but also there's no engine oil. There's no oil for your chain case. Also having no CVT means that you won't break a CVT belt. Overall, there's a lot less maintenance and man hours needed to maintain these snowmobiles. Based on 3000 kilometers per year, converting a snowmobile to electric can save up to $1,500 in maintenance cost and fuel. Now, as a fleet manager, you want to know how your fleet operates. You want to understand how much the vehicles are driven, in what conditions, the distances, the speeds, etc. And then you want to make sure that this is done safely, both for the rider, but also for the machine itself. So all Tiger snowmobiles are connected to the cloud. So as a fleet manager, what that means for you is that you can connect in one portal online and access data on all of your snowmobiles at once. You can see where they are on a GPS map. You can see the speed, the charge level, the distance they've driven, et cetera. And then you can set limits on these different things. I know a lot of resorts have speed limits for their staff, maybe 40 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour, something like that. With our snowmobiles, you can put a cap on the GPS speed. So that means that you can still use 100% of the torque and track speed. So if you're towing something heavy or in deep snow, you'll benefit from that while being limited on the GPS speed. You can also put caps on maximum speed, acceleration, torque, you can lock all of the snowmobiles in eco mode if you want. You really get control and oversight over what your fleet does. Now, finally, I wanna talk about uh, carbon reduction. So next slide, please, perfect. So for starters, these snowmobiles are quieter and they don't smell like gas. I know that a lot of national parks, at least in Canada, have prohibited snowmobiles, but park rangers and staff still have to use them. Uh, and gas snowmobiles used to be the only option when now they can transition to electric and that realigns the operations with the environmental values of the parks. Also, snow wheels are one of the only vehicles that do not require a catalytic converter. So th that leads to a single snow wheel for one season can emit the equivalent of 40 cars for a full year. The fact that these are so polluting and smelly and loud, and I know all about that. I've been a snow wheeler for my whole life. Uh, that leads to rapid access restrictions all over the world. Parks, cities, even neighborhoods are putting restrictions on snowmobiles and that prevents snowmobiles enthusiasts from enjoying them. It also puts a lot of pressure on commercial operators to reduce the use of snowmobile or to find alternative solutions. Next slide, please. To, to put things into perspective, replacing 50 snowmobiles at one ski resort has the air impact quality of electrifying 2000 cars. I think that's a powerful statement and it really puts things into perspective. Snowmobiles are pretty bad for the environment. Next slide, please. Now, to finish up, I know I went pretty quick. There was a lot of information. I wanna talk a little bit about Taiga and what the future holds for us. Um, so I mentioned that we have our Orca electric watercraft coming up this summer, and we will be starting deliveries of electric snowmobiles next year in time for winter 21-22. Fleets will get priority deliveries starting in the fall. All of these vehicles will be built in our facility in Montreal. 
Also, I'm not sure if you've heard or seen, but Tiger became a public company just last Friday. We are now listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange under TAIG, so you can check that out. We are also breaking ground this month on a new 200,000 square feet facility in Shawinigan, Quebec to take over production over the next few years. So there is definitely a lot going on. Uh, we're moving as fast as we can, but we're super excited to bring these products out on the market and for you guys to see what they can do. And then finally, I just want to thank you all for supporting the movement through electric. Sometimes it feels like it's baby steps, but it's with these small baby steps that together we'll achieve something great. I'm certain of it. So if you want to go to the next slide, that's that's all I had for you guys today. I know we have a Q&A session. Uh, if you're shy and you don't want to ask your question or if you forget, here's my email. You can take a screenshot or feel free to email me. I'd be happy to answer your questions and keep the conversation going on there as well. Thank you, guys. Well said, Anthony. Yeah. Um, we did we did get a question, a great question in the chat uh, that I did answer, but I'll, I'll go over it again. I would, I would be remiss if I didn't say that unless you have a diesel snowmobile um, in your existing fleet, you are unfortunately not eligible for the Colorado Clean Diesel Program um, as it requires you scrap a diesel vehicle and most existing snowmobiles run out of gasoline. However, uh, you know, in Anthony's uh, native country of Canada, two of the provinces, I believe, uh, British Columbia and Yukon, just uh, uh, passed policies that provide additional rebates to help with the uh, cost of, of switching to electric snowmobiles. So here in Colorado, you know, we can work with our uh, elected officials and our utilities to see if we can find some similar programs that will help uh, electrify snowmobile operations because you know, as Anthony alluded to, the emissions benefits are very substantial. Yes, and I can say that we're in talks with multiple Canadian provinces at least, and it won't be long before all of them offer grants. And I know it's not me personally, but I know that people have talks with some of the U.S. states as well. So I think you can keep an eye out. Uh, it should happen pretty soon. Amazing. So we do have a few more questions in the chat and uh, ended that right on time with 15 minutes left for us. Um, if you guys have any other questions, please throw them in the Q&A box. Um, do you have a question uh, kind of across the board for um, Pissimboli and Taiga, but can you tell us about the fuel economy compared to uh, conventional machines? And Anthony, I know you, you had a percentage in your, um, presentation, but can you guys just uh, speak to that? Well, I mean, Anthony's is all the no, no fuel economy because it's all yeah. electric. <laughs> um, <clears throat> on the, on the 600 E plus, um, it's, it's a 20% fuel savings. Um, I was able to go out and run this machine as well as demo it at the resorts. And we were able to demo it against a, a 600 of the same generation of ours. So you were comparing, you know, two very similar machines and and uh, very consistently running the same way uh, and operating them very similar as far as speed and tiller settings. We were seeing over a, a gallon an hour fuel savings on the E plus. So, um, you know, I guess the the claim from the manufacturer is the twenty percent, and I've I've definitely seen that with my own eyes. Um, you know, like like anything you put it in the wrong hands and you can decrease that fuel savings and you put it in the right hands and you can even increase it. So uh, that's, I guess, uh, hopefully that answers the question. Maybe Connor, do you have any data or just kind of personal testimony to what you've seen at Crystal Mountain in terms of, you know, the, the fuel consumption and savings of a, of a e-machine versus a conventional diesel? Yeah, I don't have any actual like measured numbers or anything, but I'd say that checks out just from like our day to day operations. You know, we run them every day and we're, we're putting, I would, I would guess right now about that 20% less fuel in those cats every night and they're doing the same jobs as everything. And that's, um, you know, that although one, one, go ahead, Connor, sorry. One other thing I was, uh, I forgot to mention that we do a lot of, we do a lot of towing with our snow cats um, to, to haul food up to our on mountain restaurants and stuff like that. And uh, 
that's another area that the ECATs have been really good with. It's a lot easier to tow with those torquey electric motors. Definitely. And then I think that's a, that provides a good uh, segue to one of our other questions. Um, can you talk a little bit about the maintenance side of the um, uh, e-machines, you know, compared to diesel ones? Anthony, you know, alluded to the significant uh, reduction in maintenance and, and costs and just, you know, man hours there. But how is it for the hybrid electric snowcat versus yeah. conventional snowcat? Maybe Connor jump in first and then oh. we'll have Adam add to that. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty comparable. Um, I would say to our traditional machines there, there are some, there's a little bit of additional training for mechanics and stuff to, you know, learn about the high voltage systems and everything like that. And there's some transformer fluid. That's like, a you know, just one extra little fluid to check and stuff every day. But, um, I'd say it's pretty comparable. We we haven't really had to do too many things out of the ordinary. Um, and, you know, with the five or 6,000 hours we have on them, they spend a pretty similar amount of time in the shop with regular maintenance stuff and, you know, problems that come up. Um, but, I you know, also ours we're like some of the first ones in the country. So I, I don't know if, uh, I think by now also the tier four machines might have less maintenance. Adam probably knows better than I about that kind of stuff. Yeah, so just like kind of what Anthony said with the, the snowmobiles as well, the uh, the electric part of it, so the electric drivetrain is uh, their long life and their, their low maintenance. Um, as Connor said, really the only thing is just like a transformer, there's an oil in there, everything's all sealed. So as far as your mechanics and training, they're not gonna be going in and doing electrical work inside of an electrical component. The, you would just pull that component out and get a new one to plug in. Um, but with the long life and low maintenance, we haven't seen a lot of uh, you know failures happening. And then as far as the rest of the Snowcat goes, it, it runs exactly the same as your, your traditional all diesel one. So the hydraulic system, um, you know, your suspension system and all your summer maintenance and everything is actually exactly the same. Uh, so that's one of the, the big parts of the program was that we didn't want to, you know, put additional load on the shops and everything. So everything's very, very similar to, to what you would be used to in a standard diesel machine. And that, that maybe brings up a, a good question for Adam alluded to a little bit, but for Anthony as well. Um, you know, are, are the companies respectively, you know, actively working with ski resorts operations on any kind of training that's needed to, to work on, on these uh, kind of new technologies? So the, the main training and anybody that works on the machine or runs the machine goes through a, a very short class to, to understand the, I guess, the dangers of the electrical system. Um, you know, Pretty much the main thing for training for for your mechanics is is just uh, de-energizing the machine. There's a it's a pretty simple process to de-energize it, to lock it out, and then you know you you have the assurance that there's no no charge in the machine while you're working on it. Um, and then, like I alluded to, the the electrical components there's no there's no mechanic at any resort that's going to be working on those components. Those components go back to the factory to be to be worked on by by the, their manufacturer. That's the perfect answer, is uh, steer clear of everything that's high voltage to stay safe. Make sure you don't get shocked and the rest, leave it to us, we'll take care of it. Awesome. Um, we have a question that I think I am best equipped to answer. Uh, for the Colorado Clean Diesel Program, what is the current time frame for the program? So uh, again, we, we accept applications on a rolling basis. So you can submit an application at any time. And uh, once we've received an application, the application review team will probably take, um, you know, between two to four weeks to review the application um, and then get in touch with the applicant about uh, status of uh, approval of, you know, the grants or um, 
denial. And then from there, we uh, go into signing a grant agreement that kind of just verifies all of the, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities of each party in order to be eligible for the funding. And then we execute a purchase order. The uh, applicant then can, you know, place an order through uh, Piss and Bully or another manufacturer. They will receive the equipment, um, do the scrappage, provide all the documentation. Um, and then once we receive all that documentation, we need at least uh, 60 days to uh, submit all of that paperwork to EPA and then we can reauthorize the funding. But, um, you know, we're committed to working with uh, procurement teams and, you know, operations teams to make this process as smooth as possible. So, you know, it's our hope that we can work with ski resorts to um, get some of these new uh, uh, hybrid electric or, um, you know, future technologies in time for the upcoming ski season. So Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, my understanding is that lots of ski resorts and operations take delivery of new equipment in October uh, prior to ski season. And so we're, we're really dedicated to working with interested and prospective applicants um, to stay aligned with those kind of procurement cycles. And then question for Adam, do, can you say anything about the pricing details for the uh, fully electric 100E? Yeah, so the, the price on that unit has not been set. Um, as the testing phase goes on, we always try different components. And one, one of the goals is that when we do bring it to market, that it's affordable. Um, anybody that's got pricing on the 600 E plus sees that, yeah, there's an increase over your standard diesel machine, but it's, it's not the sticker shock some people think it's going to be. And that's kind of our goal with the 100 is, you know, it's going to be a little bit more than the current technology, but we still want to make it affordable. And uh, especially with a program um, like this, then, you know, it actually makes it quite a bit less than a conventional machine. So as far as a number, I can't give you, but we, we're going to do our best to make it, you know, as affordable a machine as possible. Um, I actually have, this is Zuleika with Clear, and I have a question for Anthony um, because I am curious about when um, ski resorts might be able to um, purchase the nomads and, and start using them as part of their fleets. Yeah, so we've done some testing this, uh, this winter. Uh, we did a lot in Canada and a little bit in the U.S., just that the border situation was a little bit tough, so we couldn't go as much as we wanted. But I saw that we have some people from Eldora here today. We were actually in Eldora two weeks ago doing some testing and demos with them. Uh, we did a, a few other resorts, Vale, and we went to Steamboat. So we were in your guys' turf. Um, so fleets will be able to get them next winter. So sometime in the fall, uh, it'll be available. I, I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, fleets do have priority over everything else. So fleets will get number one seat. Uh, at some point in the fall, we'll, we want to make sure that it's in, in Fleets' hands before the winter so that you can get familiarized with them and then you can start using them in the winter. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think we've hit all of our questions that you guys have, have thrown out in the Q&A. Thanks so much for being so engaged. Those, those questions were great. And it's so good to learn about these technologies a little bit more and you know how you all are planning to use them. Uh, that is the end of our presentation today. We will be sending out a recording of this webinar to all people who registered, um, as well as the slide deck. So you'll get everyone's contact info who spoke today. And as always, please reach out to myself or Geraldine at NSAA if we can be of any help in the climate challenge or sustainable slopes. Um, reach out to Stefan and Zuleika at CLEAR for more info on the grant funding. And then, of course, thank you so much to Connor, Adam, and Anthony for chiming in today and sharing their technologies and experiences. Um, Connor, too, so helpful to have boots on the ground and uh, telling us about these machines and how you use them. Uh, thanks all for joining and uh, have a great spring season.